Nehemiah, we've been looking at these books that, that come towards the end of the Old Testament, books that are set in the time period of Israel's return from exile after spending 70 years as slaves in the land of Babylon, uh, Israel has been permitted to return home to Palestine. The Babylonian Empire has fallen to the Persians, and King Cyrus, whose heart the Lord controls, decreed to send the Jews home to permit them to rebuild the temple for their God. This is something that God had promised in the prophets would happen Though Jerusalem had been destroyed, though the temple had been destroyed, uh, he promised that their exile would be temporary. One day he would bring them home. He, he would, every mountain would be leveled. Every valley would be brought up. A highway in the desert would be prepared for Israel to go home and for their God to go home with them. And God would do great things. He would restore them to their land. He would rebuild their temple. He would reestablish their kingdom. The nations would flock to Jerusalem. And this generation that has come home from exile has seen the beginning of those promises. Zechariah ministered to that generation who came home, who began work on the temple of the Lord. They laid the foundation. But as we remember from some of these studies, they encountered opposition. The nations that were around them, the the non-Jewish people who had been put into that land and were still there when Israel came home, were opposed to the building project. They wrote home and said to the Persians, you you need to put the stop on this. This will only encourage rebellion and disloyalty. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. The work on the temple came to a conclusion or came to a halt. And this caused tension for the people of God. Here they are, they're back home. They've seen the beginning of God's promises, but where's the rest of what God promised? Where's the, the nation flocking to them in submission because they've been exalted once again as head of the nations. God has promised glorious restoration, but the restoration is not taking place quite as the people imagined it. And that discouragement has contributed to their lack of initiative to rebuild the temple, to do everything that God has commanded them to do. So Zechariah then is much like Haggai, who we looked at two weeks ago. His message to the people is that they need to rebuild the temple. They need to finish that work of rebuilding The temple. But whereas Haggai came at it from twin uh, perspectives, one was a challenge, a little bit of a rebuke, consider your priorities. And the other was, remember what God has promised to do, that he will use this temple in his purpose and in his salvation plan to bring salvation to the earth. This temple plays a critical role. So, So rebuild. In light of what God has promised to do, rebuild the temple. Zechariah comes at it from the angle of emphasizing God's presence with the people. That God has brought Israel home to Palestine and he has come home with them. And because he is with them, therefore they should serve him. They should respond. They should do the things he's asked them to do in light of his presence and in light of all that he has promised. So a major theme that we'll see throughout the book of Zechariah this evening is God's return to his people. If you were to look at the book of Ezekiel, He's a prophet who ministered during the exile. At the beginning of his prophet, when when Israel is still at home, he sees the glory of God departing from the temple and going away. And later, Israel themselves is taken away from their homeland and taken into Babylon. But towards the end of Ezekiel, in the latter chapters, he foresees a future day when God's glory will return to Palestine, when a glorious temple will be rebuilt and God's glory will be there. Zechariah proclaims that day has come. God has turned from his judgment and he has come to his people in mercy and he will return to dwell among them. He will renew them and he will be with them. I want us to look into that theme. We'll overview the whole book like we've done these these weeks, read a few select passages, see the main ideas of Zechariah, how he develops this idea that God is returning to his people and that is their basis then to respond in obedience. The first theme comes from the very first six verses of the book. And we'll read these from chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. Here is where God emphasizes his return. Having dealt with Israel in judgment, he now returns to them in mercy. Look at chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. In the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, son of Berechiah, the son of Edu. 
The Lord was very angry with your ancestors. Therefore, tell the people. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Return to me, declares the Lord Almighty, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. Do not be like your ancestors, to whom the earlier prophets proclaimed, this is what the Lord Almighty says, turn from your evil ways and your evil practices. But they would not listen or pay attention to me, declares the Lord. Where are your ancestors now? And the prophets, do they live forever? But did not my words and my decrees, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, overtake your ancestors? Then they repented and said, The Lord Almighty has done to us what our ways and practices deserve, just as he determined to do. Zechariah leads off the book basically by summarizing almost the entire Old Testament. What you just read in those verses is really the history of Israel going back to the end of Deuteronomy, right before they entered the promised land, and all the way up to the prophet Zephaniah. So the whole Old Testament and the first nine of the minor prophets and all of the major prophets. He gives this summary, which is basically this. That when the people got in the land and they settled in and things were going good for them, just as Moses had warned them in Deuteronomy 8, they began to forget the Lord. They turned aside to idols and they worshipped other gods. And so God sent prophets to them, Elijah and Elisha, Isaiah, all those prophets that you read about in the Old Testament, and said, turn from your ways. But the people wouldn't do it. And so finally, when mercy had run out, when enough warnings had been given and the people would not respond, God brought them into exile. He took them into the land of Babylon. But this is the emphasis of of Zechariah. That time has ended. And now the Lord is returning to his people. And that's why he gives them that call in verse 3. Return to me and I will return to you. You've suffered for your sins. You you have suffered the consequences. Really, you've brought these circumstances on yourselves, the Lord says. But that's not how God deals with them. He does not give them everything they deserve. Rather, he returns to them in mercy, calling them to return to him. And as God has moved to be merciful to them so they can respond to him and worship him and draw near to him because of his mercy. So that's how Zechariah sets up the book, God's merciful return. Here's the second theme. The rest of chapter one and all the way through the end of chapter six is a series of visions, eight visions in particular. We won't look at all eight. We'll only look at the very first. Because it sets the stage for all eight visions. And here's what Zechariah emphasizes in these visions. That God is jealous for his people. Not only is he returning to them, but like one who loves them appropriately, he is jealous for them. Look at verse 7 in chapter 1. We'll read through verse 17. On the 24th day of the 11th month, the month of Shabbat, and the second year of Darius, The word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, son of Berechiah, the son of Edu. During the night I had a vision, and there before me was a man mounted on a red horse. He was standing among the myrtle trees in a ravine. Behind him were red, brown, and white horses. I asked, what are these, my Lord? The angel who was talking with me answered, I will show you what they are. Then the man standing among the myrtle trees explained, these are the ones the Lord has sent to go throughout the earth. And they reported to the angel of the Lord who was standing among the myrtle trees, we have gone throughout the whole earth and have found the whole world at rest and in peace. Then the angel of the Lord said, Lord Almighty, how long will you withhold mercy from Jerusalem and from the towns of Judah, which you have been angry with these 70 years? So the Lord spoke kind and comforting words to the angel who talked with me. Then the angel who is speaking to me said, proclaim this word. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I am very jealous for Jerusalem and Zion, and I am very angry with the nations that feel secure. I was only a little angry, but they went too far with the punishment. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. I will return to Jerusalem with mercy, and there my house will be rebuilt, and the measuring line will be stretched out over Jerusalem, declares the Lord Almighty. Proclaim further, this is what the Lord Almighty says. My towns will again overflow with prosperity, and the Lord will again comfort Zion. And choose Jerusalem. Here's what's going on in this vision. He refers to the 70 years very early on. That's the exile we mentioned. God's punishment on Israel for their idolatry. 70 years in the land of Babylon. And in order to bring that about, God used means. 
When God devises things, he very often uses earthly means to carry it out. And the means of his punishment was the Babylonians. He calls them the rod in his hand, using that picture of discipline. He used the Babylonians to punish Israel and to take them in exile. But notice what God says. They went too far, he says. I was a little angry, but they went too far with the punishment. In other words, God was disciplining Israel. But this nation, though they were the rod of his hands, they acted in a way that went far beyond the bounds of of normal, proper ways to act, as if we could call warfare proper. But they were cruel and unusual, and they went way beyond the bounds, and and God says, now I'm going to punish them. I used them to punish you, now I'm going to punish them. And that's why you have this vision of the horses going out and looking at the earth. What do they find? The nations are calm and secure. They're at rest. Israel has suffered, but all the other nations are doing fine. And this is God's purpose. They are at rest there, content with what they have done. And so I'm going to punish them for what they have done, for the way they treated my people. One writer says, The Lord has already decided to judge the nations at ease and to restore Zion. History has already been decided by the Lord of history, and Jerusalem's renewal is the key to the future. In other words, God's saying, I'm very angry now with the nations, and I will be merciful to my people, and I will bring them home, and they will rebuild this temple, and I will prosper their city once again. When God acts to restore his people and to renew his people, and when God comes home to his people, he comes to them in mercy and in jealousy for them, punishing their enemies and blessing his people. That's the second main theme. Brings us up to chapter 7 and 8. You can turn ahead there for a moment. Chapters 7 and 8 of Zechariah, where the prophet now makes the point that God forgives and blesses. That God forgives and blesses. This is why a lot of times they say the Old Testament and the New Testament preach the same gospel. Here is God in mercy and forgiveness towards his people. Chapter 7 is all about a question that comes up regarding fasting. A group of people come to Zechariah and they say, okay, during the exile, we fasted for the, during the fifth and the seventh months. And those probably commemorate the destruction of the temple and then the later assassination of Gedaliah. He was the regional governor appointed by the Babylonians to look after things after the waves of exile took place. So the people who remained assassinated him, then they fled to Egypt. They just kept bringing upon themselves the wrath of Babylon and the punishment of God. They come to Zechariah and they say, should we keep this fast up? But Zechariah actually responds to them by, by questioning their motives, but by saying that these fasts have turned into somewhat self-seeking religious displays. And instead, he puts the emphasis on what he really wants, love for him and love for neighbor. Look at chapter 7, verses 8 through 10. And the word of the Lord came again to Zechariah. This is what the Lord Almighty said, Administer true justice, show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the foreigner or the people. Do not plot evil against one another. It's not too different from the way Jesus himself taught about fasting, that the focus was to be not on a religious display that brings one attention, but on serving others and administering justice and loving one's neighbor as you love yourself. Chapter 7 then transitions into chapter 8, which is a vision of, of the future. The rebuke about fasting turns into encouragement as Zechariah reminds the people of God's purpose to restore them. Look at the beginning of chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. The word of the Lord Almighty came to me. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I am very jealous for Zion. I am burning with jealousy for her. This is what the Lord says. I will return to Zion and dwell in Jerusalem. Then Jerusalem will be called the faithful city and the mountain of the Lord Almighty will be called the holy mountain. Here's what God is saying. It's time to put aside the religious festivals. I'm not interested in the religious observances. I am coming back to you. I am restoring you. It's like what Jesus said. to the, You don't rejoice while you have the bridegroom with you. It's only when he's taken away. And God's saying, I'm coming back to you in mercy and in restoration and in forgiveness. And chapter 8 goes on. It gives 10 promises of blessing, including God's presence with his people doing good to them, and eventually bringing all of the nations to them. This is the God who forgives and blesses. This is how he is returning to his people. Let's come then to the fourth section, which presents to us God as Israel's shepherd 
and his protector. This concerns chapters 9 through 11. Now, the section opens with God's promises to defeat all of Israel's oppressors and ancient foes. So he's bringing them back home. He's with them. They're going to rebuild the temple. What about the nations around them? Well, God says, I'm going to deal with them too. Look, for example, at chapter 9, verse 8. This summarizes everything in chapter 9 so far. God says, but I will encamp at my temple to guard it against marauding forces. Never again will an oppressor overrun my people, for now I am keeping Watch. So there's God's promise. I'm going to destroy everybody. I'm going to protect my people. I'm going to hurt those who try to hurt her. Well, how will God do this? Look at the next verse, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Keep in mind, Israel's back home, and they have no king currently on the throne. But God promises that one day I'm going to come and I'm going to defeat all your enemies and I'm going to do it by means of this humble king who will come to you in a lowly manner. In other words, it will be the Messiah who will ultimately carry out all of these promises of God. And and this is one of those sections where as we read through what God is doing, expectation is building, but sometimes our vision is a little clearer when we stand on this side of the New Testament to see how all of this works out. Very often in in Zechariah, the prophet will combine the near and the far in one statement. Think about it like this. If you drive down to Greenville, if you go down Hayward Road towards uh, the Faith Free Church, you ever go down and you see the Blue Ridge Mountains in the distance, and they almost look flat. There's a lot of mountains there, and they're not all at the same place. Some are closer, some are farther away. When we read the prophets, sometimes the near and the far almost compress into one another. And and it's not always clear which is closer than the other. This is one of those sections where things become clearer as we stand on this side of the New Testament. God has promised to defeat all of Israel's enemies, and he's going to do it by means of the Messiah. But one of the things we learn from the New Testament is that Jesus conquers many of his foes by saving them. This is anticipated in Isaiah, uh, Isaiah 53. Jesus is the one who he tries to save all those who want to kill him. He converts many, he conquers many of his enemies by converting them, but by bringing them to the point where they surrender in their opposition to God and come humbly to him and join his side. He's the merciful king who converts those who are formerly his enemies. We also read in the New Testament that God brings this reign in in two stages. Jesus came and was crucified, and right now his focus in the world is bringing the nations to salvation, bringing people to faith in him. Eventually he will come and return, and then he will destroy those who are still opposed to him. But for now, his focus is on saving the nations. If you read through Matthew 13, it often explains that. Jesus has come, and we have the wheat and the tares. So the tares are still here, and the Jews thought, well, when the wheat comes, when the kingdom of God comes, it will obliterate all wickedness. Jesus' point is, no, you can have the wheat here. You can have the true kingdom here, and the tares aren't yet obliterated. They're going to go side by side until God himself comes and makes the great separation. You've got that parable of the soils, and you have the seed going out, and it looks like the seed is failing. The path, the rocky ground, the thorns, it might look like the seed is failing, but no, Jesus says there's seed that falls amongst the soil, Two, God will bring in his kingdom in two stages, humble beginnings, but eventually glorious fulfillment. This is what Zechariah is promising here, that God will bring his salvation to his people. He will defeat all their enemies. But the first way he's going to do it is through King Jesus, who will reign over them. If you were to read the passion narratives in the Gospels, the, 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 the crucifixion, the, the events before and after it, after the Psalms, Zechariah is the most frequently quoted Old Testament book in that section. Because how much he anticipated the ministry of Christ. God is the one who will come and be Israel's shepherd and protector. Then lastly, fifth and final section, God will come and dwell in Zion. Chapters 12 through 14, they look forward to the completion of the restoration of God's holy people by describing God's decision himself to come down and live among his people There in Zion, he will finally drive wickedness from the chosen people. 
from the city, from the priesthood, and from the royal throne, and having purified his people, then the nations will come and they will consider this to be their Zion, the dwelling place of God, their capital city, a holy place. But how will all this take place? How is it that God will come and draw all the nations to himself? Well, just listen to this summary of the final chapters of Zechariah. If we were to read through it, we would notice some of these points. There will be a particular tragedy that will change the people's hearts so that they will be prepared for God's coming to Zion. Israel will mourn over one they have pierced. This pierced one will be a royal figure. The Spirit of God will be poured out for the people to repent of this sin. As a result of this repentance, there will be a fountain of cleansing that covers all human misconduct. This cleansing will lead to the removal of idols and lying prophets. Using another image, God will strike a shepherd whose death causes God's people to be scattered. This scattering will test Israel and create a remnant who will serve the Lord. Thus, Israel and Yahweh will come to perfect harmony as the covenant stipulated, and the peoples of the world will worship God in a city completely holy to the Lord. This is what these Old Testament prophets anticipated, and this was Israel's hope. And this, by the way, was why the prophet told them that they should complete this work of rebuilding the temple, because that was the next key element that needed to take place as God carried out this salvation plan. The final result might have looked a little different from what they expected. They read these prophets and they're thinking of God coming and driving out wickedness and setting up his capital and all the nations coming, the temple being rebuilt and being made glorious. But as we consider with Haggai, the way it came out was a little different from their expectations. Jesus eventually came to this temple that they rebuilt. And he said, you can destroy this temple and in three days I will rebuild it. Why? Because he was referring to the temple of his body. And having been crucified and resurrected three days later, then 50 days later, he poured out the Spirit of God at Pentecost. And when he writes to the Corinthians, he calls them the temple of God, where God's Spirit dwells. We read this morning from 1 Peter, where he says, Jesus is the cornerstone, and we're the bricks of the temple, and we're the priests of the temple. This is the temple that God is building during our time. And who's coming to it? All the nations of the world. As he told the disciples, you go out into the world and you disciple those nations. This is how God gathers his people. This is how God fulfills his promises. This is how God purifies his people through Jesus Christ. And this is how God brings all the nations to his city as they're brought into the church, as they're converted to this lowly, humble Messiah. What do we take away from a book like this? One, God is gracious. God is gracious and loves to restore his people. There's no shortage of wrath in the Old Testament. We don't deny that for a moment. There's no shortage of wrath in the New Testament when we read about God. But God's purposes for his people are of grace, to restore them, to be patient with them, to chastise them when they sin, but ultimately to restore them and to fulfill his promises to them. Central, secondly, to all that God does is his purpose to bring Christ to his people. This is why he chose Israel. This is why he planted them in the land. This is why he gave them a temple. This is why he brought them home after all the disobedience because he had a purpose to bring Christ to his people and this is how he would bring it to be. And so thirdly, I think the last thing we take away then is that as we serve him, let our service all have reference to him. It's because of the gospel that we love him. It's because of the gospel that all of our labor for him is never in vain. As Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, building that temple might not have seemed important. They couldn't necessarily see exactly how it was all going to come to pass. Remember, there was a generation who had seen a better temple. And yet the prophets would say, you do this. This is for the glory of God. This is for saving purposes. None of this work is ever in vain. So may God encourage our hearts to continue to serve him because of what he's doing through his church, because of what he's doing through his people. And it will be faithful and gracious. Let's pray.